Oh, wonderful to have you. How many are here for the last time? <laughs> well, that's the only way to live. You should live as though this were your last day on earth. What if you die tonight? Would it be okay to go straight to heaven? Nothing to put straight? No apologies to your parents for your bad manners and all that kind of thing? <clears throat> How are you? Nice to see you. We've got some new friends along too here that are not at school. Do we have a hymn book? Bethany, I should sing, I mean, should sing better after this now. Oh, I see you've gone on tape now, too. That's great. I saw your tapes advertised, your videos. Great. Well, my, my prayer this week has been this, that in this session, which begins again, obviously, tonight, till it finishes, which may be Easter, I don't know when. I mean, not this meeting tonight, but... That won't last at least, but uh, my one prayer is that this series of nights that we have together will give us a new revelation of the majesty of God. Yeah. If I could reduce the problem of the modern church to an irreducible minimum, it, minimum, it's this. We do not know God. We know about him. We know theology. We know something of the Word of God, but we don't know very much about the God of the Word. <clears throat> and, and it really is my intense desire that this, what we call winter session, the winter weather's here already, will be to me at least, and I hope to you, a new revelation of the height and depth and length and breadth of the love of God which passeth knowledge and the personality of God himself. A lot of this is captured in the 20th hymn here. And I want us to sing this with our hearts as, as well as with our lips. The, the trouble with so many of these hymns again is they're only half of what they used to be. <laughs> You'll have to reprint another one now with another hymn book. <laughs> Number 20, I'll worship the king. You better stand and sing. Please. Let's pray. Hi. Lord, as we sing this majestic hymn, we're reminded of our own frailty. We acknowledge we're frail children of dust. From dust we came, to dust we return. But that is fair in our understanding of Thee. We think of Your glorious majesty as this hymn has declared it, that whose robe is the light and whose canopy space. And as Isaiah says, the earth is his footstool and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Lord, I want to invite you, and I trust all of us do. I'm sure Melody, these others do, and I pray the students do. We want you to invade this sanctuary yeah. Friday night by Friday night. Maybe it will be shattering for us in some experiences as you expose us to ourselves, as well as to your glory and your majesty. As you expose us to your light, we realize that we still, in a measure, walk in darkness. As you expose your strength, we realize again our weakness. As you expose us to your majestic revelation in your word, we shall realize our ignorance. But your word comes to our rescue because you have said it's the lame that take the prey. Not to the strong. This race is not to the swift. This battle is not to the strong. Our frailty is an advantage. It casts us more on yourself. Our ignorance is an advantage because we plead, almost groan in your presence for wisdom. <clears throat> Oh, that one night you may baptize us with a spirit of wisdom such as we have never had before. Yeah. 
Lord, we don't want you to say to us, when we stand before the millions around your throne, <coughs> we don't want to, do not want to say, I had many things to tell you down there at last days. But I couldn't tell you. You were too immature, too preoccupied, too diversified even in your thinking. Grant that we may be able to say with the Apostle Paul, this one thing I do, and that one thing be to pursue the holiness of God. Lord, I do not believe the world has yet seen the mightiest power of the church. I don't believe as many do that it finished with the New Testament or the days of the Apostles. <clears throat> because you've told us that your Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. Never more did we need a baptism of strength than we do this day. Never before were our enemies so arrogant, so wealthy, so dominant, so projected on the press, in the press, the newspapers, <clears throat> on the TV screens, in the radio, in the schools, in the colleges. It seems there's a, almost a conspiracy to try to de-deify the Lord Jesus Christ. To tell us how little of the word we can believe instead of how much. Lord, I believe I, can, I express the desire of all our hearts tonight. We're candidates for all the fullness of God. We don't know what all that means. We may have to stretch our hearts to contain more and stretch our thinking. <clears throat> but Lord, we pray that just as in the tabernacle of all there is a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day, that there is such a pillar of fire over the last days, whether I'm teaching anybody else's teaching, that it will throw its light not just to the boundaries of America, but to the realms of the earth. Lord, if we put it in mud and simple language, we would ask you to make this room, I would ask you each night to make this room the workshop of the Holy Ghost. Conform us, shape us to the image of your Son. We don't want to be famous people, we want to be holy people. <clears throat> we don't want to be known by men, we want to be known by God. And it seems all to be settled in the word, Lord Jesus, that you gave us. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after satisfied, uh, and after righteousness, for they shall be filled. <clears throat> As a poet said, O oh, fill me with thy fullness, Lord, until my very heart o'erflow. In kindling thought and glowing word, thy love to tell, thy praise to show. O oh, strengthen me that while I stand firm on the rock and strong in thee, I may stretch out a loving hand to wrestlers in life's troubled sea. As we open your word, we pray you'll open our eyes, open our minds. And then open our mouths to declare the revelations you give us and the purpose you have for each of our individual lives. But I don't believe that the redemptive work of God in Christ or through Christ was to get us into heaven or escape hell or save us from vicious sins. Those are fringe benefits and beautiful, but Lord, I believe it was the whole redemptive program, the blood and sweat of Gethsemane and the agony of, Ga of Calvary <clears throat> and the glory of the resurrection and the gift of the Holy Spirit that marvelous day was all that we may be conformed to the image of his Son. That's what you've told us we're elected to be, conformed to the image of the Son. <clears throat> remember all the students who have been here and have gone out from this fellowship, wherever they are tonight, bless them. We pray for the literature as it goes out. Sanctify every piece. Particularly in this horrible day of abortion, we pray you'll bless this ministry that particularly you've given to dear Melody. <clears throat> as the f tapes go out, the audios and the videos, as this issue of the paper goes out. Lord, make it a terror to the devil. <clears throat> Oh, 
Let's sing again. Let, we must sing one. I never feel we've been here if we don't sing. It's hard for me to sing it. That's number one. <coughs> Only one man that ever lived could play this. Uh, now, Bob, don't get angry with me here. <coughs> Nobody ever played uh, holy, holy, holy like Keith. Keith, listen. Maybe he is, Maybe he's playing it up there. How do you know he isn't? Don't look so incredulous, you know. I preach long and strong, but never wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's sing it. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. <clears throat> Courteous. <clears throat> so to Melody and the what I call the senior staff here and others, I want to thank you for the facilities using this lovely place again. It's home to some of us. If it isn't to you, well, come more often. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, let's look at the epistle of James. <clears throat> James, the fifth chapter, <clears throat> and I guess you'll guess what the subject is. <clears throat> there are many, many, many great biographies and autobiographies of Christians written in two volumes. A very classic work on Hudson Taylor, the first volume, a big thick thing, is called The Growth of a Soul, which shows you the growth of the boy that got saved to the time he became a lonely missionary in, in central China. He founded the China Inland Mission. All the other missions went on the, on the coast, but he penetrated into the center. <clears throat> the second volume is called The Growth of the Work. <clears throat> Remarkable thing, that man never asked for a penny, never took an offering in a meeting. Now, it's no good you doing that. If your faith hasn't stretched that far, you better not try it. <clears throat> but maybe it will stretch so far. Verse 17, Elias, Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are. Now that cuts away all the excuses we make that we're not kind of angels or half cherubims or born with a super intellect or something. <clears throat> he was a man of like passions as we are. If you doubt that, he stood up to 850 men and ran away from one woman. Isn't that amazing? <clears throat> so he must have been as nervous as we are. <clears throat> What did it say? He was a man subject to like passion as we are, and he prayed. That's volume one. Volume two is verse 18, and he prayed again. Now, I don't know how you were raised and <clears throat> what background you have. I'm very glad that I wasn't raised in a day when my Sunday school teacher brought Muppets or Puppets or something like that along. <clears throat> we were taught... Uh, properly, of course, in England, <coughs> that uh, <coughs> I still remember many of those wonderful Sunday school stories. You know, the favorites were nearly all children are David and Goliath. Oh, we love that. You know, the odds are so different. Or Samson. But as I've read the background of this story of Elijah, I wonder why Elijah isn't listed with the same kind of person. I don't know any man more heroic in the whole of the word of God until Jesus himself came than Elijah. Turn back to the 18th chapter, pardon me, the 17th chapter in the first book of Kings. <clears throat> now in case I forget, you know, I do forget sometimes. <clears throat> Martin, you're too young to forget, I know that. Do you know the law that there are three, three things about old age? Do you know that one? The first is loss of memory. I can't remember the other two. <laughs> but it wasn't until I read this, I must have read this 70 years. It wasn't until this week I realized this is a classical example, this story, if ever there is one, 
It's a classical example of a man that shut up heaven. What he bound on earth, bound in heaven, was bound on earth. And what he released in heaven was released on earth. Yeah. But why didn't anybody ever tell me that? You can't plead ignorance. I've told you tonight. <coughs> Let me look at my watch. I don't, I don't use it much. <coughs> at the end of the first, uh, in the first book of Kings, chapter 16, <coughs> beginning at verse 30, let me tell you my old joke again here. I read, of course, from the uh, Living Bible, King James Version. <coughs> <laughs> the NIV, how many of you have an NIV? Good, burn them. <coughs> Do you know what the NIV is? It's exactly the same text as the Jehovah Witness Bible. It has 500 less words than the King James Version. Some of them should be omitted from the King James, but not all that anyhow. But, verse <coughs> uh, 30 of... 1 Kings 16, 16 verse 30 says, Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. Now 58 years before this there had been the dividing of the kingdom. Then you have a whole succession of kings. The last king that we mention here is Ahab. He was the seventh. Now the second king did more evil than the first, the third did more evil than the second, and you go right down till you come to Ahab, and he does more than all the aggregate iniquity of all the kings that were before him. <coughs> verse 33, or verse 30, 32. He reared an altar to Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And they have made a grove and did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. In his days did heal the Bethelite, Bill Jericho, he laid the foundation thereof in Abiram his firstborn and set up the gates thereof in his youngest son. Why did he rebuild Jericho? Well, why did it fall down? Some men that walked around it how many times? How many? Right. You've got a new version. This lady just made a new version. She says seven. <coughs> they marched around seven days, and then on the last day, they marched around what? How many times? Oh, I, I'll leave. I'm going to do your homework for you. you <coughs> you're lazy enough, apparently, without me encouraging you. Okay. He rebuilt Jericho, which God said should never be rebuilt. <clears throat> and it says what he raised up an altar to Baal and then he raised, raised groves you know what that, that word there really means uh, the nearest we can get to it is a totem pole it's a place where they assembled to worship but they did not assemble to worship God <clears throat> ok Elijah the Tishbite, chapter 17, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, there shall be no before whom I stand. You know, if you stand before God, you'll never kneel before anybody else, for sure. There shall not be dew nor rain these years according to the word of the Lord. According to my word. The reason this man was so courageous was he had a deep, deep settled conviction that you and I have to have if we're going to serve God. And that was that the word of the Lord came to him. You know, when Satan came to Jesus, what did Jesus do? In modern language, he threw the book at him. Every time Satan came, Jesus said, It is written, it is written, it is written, it is written. Well, that's what God wants us to do. <coughs> The word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. His conviction, courage was established in his convictions. All right, verse 2. 
the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the book Kirith that is before Jordan. Now this man is going to stand up against a multitude of people. Do you remember the Proverbs? Proverbs, what, 28, 1 says, The wicked flee. It doesn't mean that little thing that bides with the wicked flee. It means the wicked flee, they fly. I think those little things are wicked, sure, but... <clears throat> The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. What does it say in the, uh, what psalm is it there? Psalm 3, I think, in verse 8. <clears throat> I will not be afraid that a horse should encamp against me. Montgomery, an old English hymn writer, said that prayer is the Christian's vital breath, the Christian's native air. His watchword at the gates of death, he enters heaven by prayer. O thou by whom we come to God, the life, the truth, the way, the path of prayer thyself hath taught, Lord, teach us how to pray. <clears throat> there is no ministry more searching than the ministry of prayer. You can get by in other things. You know, I didn't realize until yesterday, you smart folk have thought this often, I'm sure. But you know, Jesus said to his disciples in Gethsemane, watch with me. But he never said, pray for me. The disciples said, Lord, teach us to sing. No? What? Oh, oh it was Paul who said, uh, men ought always to sing and not to faint. No? Two struck out twice. <clears throat> oh, James said, when you're sick, sing to one another. That would make some of us sick if somebody sang to us, wouldn't it, sometimes? <clears throat> you know, the self-sufficient do not pray. The self-satisfied don't want to pray, and the self-righteous cannot pray. There are men going around these days doing all kinds of miracles. What have they got? And they're living in adultery. <clears throat> and they get by with it. Some are frauds with money and they get by with it. But you see, in prayer, essentially, the psalmist says, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? He that hath clean hands. That's significant of our dealings with the world. And a pure heart, which is our relationship with God. There's nothing more demanding. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Which means, of course, again, into the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> the psalmist was an amazing man. Tragic in some ways. But even though he was wealthy and he sat on a throne, he had armies. <clears throat> Can I say this? He was on the top of the chart singing. Yeah, he got, he got up there, and he said, in the streets they're singing, Saul has slain his thousands, but David is tens of thousands. He had an army. I guess he lived in a palace. He had all the accoutrements of a king. <clears throat> and yet his language is, bow down thy ear and hear me, for I am poor and needy. Prayer is the language of the poor. Again, he says, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him. When do you cry most to God? When you're at the end of the line. When you've no patience left, or when you've no grace left, or when you've uh, no resources left, you cry in your poverty. Why shouldn't we cry in our riches as well as in, as well as in our poverty? Yeah. The word of the Lord came unto him, <clears throat> and said, Get thee hence. And hide thyself. Notice there, that's chapter 17 and verse what? Verse what? Verse 3. Hide thyself. If your Bible's big enough, if it isn't to look across the page, turn to chapter 18. And verse 1 says, It came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go and show thyself. The secret of his life, again, is obedience. I said it often, I'll say it again. Some of you haven't heard this wisdom, so I must share it with you. Trust and obey. 
For what? And if you don't trust and obey, you rust and decay. So do one or the other. That's right, put it down, you may never hear that again. <coughs> but it's true. I got that from an old, old, old Nazarene preacher in England. He used to quote that over and over again to young people, trust and obey. It's no good having profound theology. It's no good having a lot of knowledge of the Bible if we don't trust and obey. Go hide thyself. So what did he do? He went and he hid himself by the brook Kirith that is before Jordan. It says you shall drink of the brook and I've commanded the ravens to feed me there. Now, uh, I hate to say this, but a raven is a carnivorous bird. We've got a lot of their family around here. Not my family, their family. Those big ugly birds, you know, that fly on the road and they dive down and eat the corruption that somebody's knocked over a stinking skunk, but they still eat it. I suppose that's their particular flavor. They like it. They knocked the road. Somebody else, somebody killed a deer at the top of our road a while ago. All the birds were there eating, devouring. Now, an eagle will never eat corruption, never eat carrion. That's where we're likened to eagles, I suppose. We should never eat it either. Reading junk and watching TV junk. But you see, the scholars get by here. They say, well, do you know that word raven is uh, <coughs> there? It's capable of being translated two ways. You can translate it as a bird, or, or the same Hebrew word uh, is used for Arab. Well, mercy on us. Doesn't that increase the miracle, an Arab feeding a Jew? <laughs> I've commanded an Arab to feed thee there. What? No, no, no. No, I believe it, 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 it came, you know. Now, what do you think he did every morning when he got up? Do you think he climbed a tree and said, Lord, don't let anybody shoot my bird down. He's bringing my breakfast right now. <laughs> no, no, uh, <clears throat> Maybe this means we should only have two meals a day. That would help us out a lot down there, wouldn't it, Melody? Bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening and no snacks in between. I understand now around here they don't eat between snacks anyhow. <coughs> <coughs> bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening. Go hide thyself. Do you think he left his mailing address? <coughs> Send my mail on? The hardest thing in the world is to get away from people. You can't tell me one man inside of the word of God or outside of it who hasn't been a loner. That doesn't mean he just goes on an island, Isle of Patmos or something, but it does mean he knows how to separate himself from people. I'm just reading the word of Jesus today, come here apart and rest a while. <clears throat> Get thee hence and hide thyself by the brute Kirith. I've commanded the ravens today, feed thee there. So here's his obedience, verse 5. He went and did according to the word of the Lord. I've told the story often, let me abridge it. Dr. Tozer, one day when I went to his office, was reading a, a dog eared letter. A little man that died uh, about two years ago now in Africa called Duma. <coughs> that little man got saved in a Baptist church. I used this in South Carolina, and a man, a man at the back was smiling, and he came up afterwards. I liked the story on Duma. I said, did you? He said, yeah, because my daddy was the pastor of that church, and I was in the church when it happened. The little guy ran to the, to the uh, front at the altar call, got wonderfully saved, Going out, the pastor looked at him. He never, had never saw black people in their meetings anyhow. <clears throat> and he said, uh, what can I do for you? And the little fellow said, give me a church. Give you what? Give me a church. Oh, oh, you're the man that was kneeling at the front a few minutes ago. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. I know the color of your suit. Nobody else has a suit like that. You were kneeling at the front. You're the man that was kneeling. No, he said. I'm the man that came from there. He said, that man you saw died down there. 
Wouldn't it be nice if everybody knew that when they got saved? And that's what, uh, that's what Romans 6 is all about, buried with him in baptism. If you go in there unbroken, unrepentant, all you do is go in that water a dry sinner and come out a wet sinner. Won't save you. Well, when he couldn't have a church, to cut the long story short, he went outside of Durban in South, Aust uh, South Africa, <coughs> walked up the road, found a footpath, followed the footpath, found a stream, went by the stream, found a cave, took a rock and he marked on the outside of the rock <coughs> and he stayed there 21 days and 21 nights and didn't eat any bread, didn't eat anything, he just drank water at the end of that he said Lord I want to preach and that preacher said I couldn't preach so you tell me that I can preach and he labored and prayed and God revealed himself to him and said you're going to preach and you're going to have a healing ministry which is unusual for a Baptist I guess <coughs> all due respect but anyhow <coughs> that's what happened what happened he went to Durban they gave him a shack across the tracks just a tin building that held about 10 people there were about 10 or 12 going he built it to a congregation of about 2,000 every Sunday morning not only did white people go government officials went to hear him <coughs> God had told him he would have a miracle ministry and he believed God Everywhere he went, people were healed. He called some deacons one night and said, can you come to a hospital? Yes, so they went to hospital. He reported in to the lady at the desk there, and, and she said, yes, his number is, uh, what, say, 22 in room 13. Oh, deacon went as white as death, he said. Did you hear that? To the other deacon, yeah. You heard what he said? Yeah, room number 22, room 13. But that's the Lord. He said, yes, that's right. Pastor, do you know that, 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 that it's the morgue you're going to? He said, well, it was a morgue Jesus went to when Lazarus was in it, and if he's the same yesterday and today and forever, what's the problem? Well, they went in the morgue. He looked at number 22. You know, everybody was quiet in the place, and so... <laughs> He just pulled a curtain on one side and then he pulled the cover and there's a guy laying like this. You know. And Doom was just a little guy so he climbed up on the, on, on, on the body of the man and laid on top of him. <clears throat> well, I wouldn't dare do that. <clears throat> and he just said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise. And the corpse went, <clears throat> Now if he'd done that with me on him, I would have hit the ceiling. <laughs> What, what happened? I've got this book. I, I wish we could get permission to reprint it. It's, did you read it? Wasn't it wonderful? Uh, it's the only copy in America as far as I know. I understood that there was a, a lot made and they got burned or something, some fire in Africa. But we have, still have that copy. And he subsequently had a ministry like that. You see, he dared to believe God. Go out on a limb, sure, he got the word of God. God told him in that cave. Now, the wonderful thing is, to me is not that he went to that cave and stayed 21 days and nights without eating, just drinking of the stream. It's that he went back the same day every year for about 20 years. Said goodbye to his wife, goodbye to the deacons, and went in the cave and stayed 21 days and 21 nights. You know, some people go, oh, I remember that. I've written it in my Bible, you know, in case you forget when you got filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, if you forget it, I don't think you ever have it. I don't believe we have to put it down in, on paper. At least I don't have to put it down on paper. But he went back anyhow. Stayed 21 days and 20 nights. If you buy a new car, you don't expect to put fill, you know, if it's 25 gallons it holds, you don't expect to fill it at once and run it for the rest of your life, do you? Are there repeated baptisms of the Spirit? Mr. Finney said that, didn't he, Martin? I started using an illustration, I forgot the other Sunday. If you came in this room and it was dark, and you walk in and you say, there's, no, there's nothing in that room. There is, there's air, otherwise you'll fall down. There's no light, you switch the light on, it's full of air, you fill it with light, you fill it with people, you fill it with song. You can fill what is full over and over and over again without emptying it. What about a glass of water? Well, fill it with, with water. Then what do you do? You drop uh, one spot of ink in it and it colors the whole glass. 
It's full of water, now it's full of color. You fill a room, it's full of air, then it's full of people. You turn on the heat, it's full of heat. Some lady visited the Avon lady and she comes down the aisle and everybody smells. <clears throat> and she fills the room with fragrance so that the room is filled with light, it's filled with people, it's filled with song, it's filled with, filled with heat, it's filled with perfume. Do you think that you got everything that God had for you the night you were filled with the Holy Ghost? If you think you, you do think that, you're wrong. Why does pre Paul pray for people who are filled with the Holy Ghost, number one, that they may be filled with the knowledge of his will? Or that they may be filled with joy and peace in believing? Some of those things kind of evaporate. They're subject to change and decay. And so we do if you don't, I do. I know I need repeated anointings or what we call them, baptisms, if you like, of the Holy Spirit of God. Yeah. I think most of us would do with a, a baptism of wisdom. Wouldn't that help most of us? Yeah. Just you and I, Melody. Okay, dear. <coughs> yes, that's what we need. Okay. What do you think he was thinking about while he was in that cave? Did you ever think of that? Do you think he took a, a big scroll like this, first book of Chronicles, and uh, asked for delivery of the second edition or something? What was he thinking about? He was a man of light passions. Don't you think the devil assailed him? You fool, what are you doing here? In this dark, dusty, damp cave. You could be home eating good meals. You haven't had a meal now for two weeks. Come on. You know, faith that is going to be trusted is going to be tested. Yeah. Your faith and mine is not real until it's proved. You can have a theological faith that does nothing. You can believe in the fundamentals, as we say, and do nothing. Right. But faith has to be tested. And then when it's being proved, we have a new strength, a new realization that we're not standing on something flimsy, that that actually we have a hold on God, and by the grace of God, he has a hold on us. <clears throat> he did according to the word of God. Verse 7, it came to pass after a while that the book dro dro dried up. Well, isn't that what always happens? There's nothing supernatural about a brook. There's something supernatural about a raven coming twice a day and bringing you bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening, but the natural thing is for the brook. And the natural things always dry up first. Our courage dries up. What seems to be our inspiration dries up. Sometimes our vision dries up. There are areas in our lives which dry up. But wait a minute. By the same token, the supply of God's wisdom, the su supply of inspiration from God does not need to dry up. He came to... What do you think he felt like the first morning when he, when he just came out of his cave and said, Whoa, what? Oh, the air so lovely. Boy, the stream this morning, this fresh water from the mountains, you know, it came down from the snows. Oh, it... Oh, it isn't there. Now what do you do? Huh? No 7-Eleven stores around here or anything. Notice God said, I've commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Didn't say, did he? I don't remember. Maybe check me here. Didn't say the book is going to last forever. He fully expected that. It was normal. That book will be there in the morning like it's been every morning. But it just wasn't there. You know, that's something when your source of supply dries up on the human level, isn't it? God has to do that sometimes. Hudson Taylor I mentioned recently, recently, <clears throat> earlier. He said that he uh, and his people used to pray, and a rich lady in America, every time they prayed, they got into a bind financially about every three months, and every time they did, this lady in America sent them a big fat check. One day they were in a real bind, they prayed, and nothing happened, and they prayed, and nothing, oh, they prayed more than a week, nothing happened. Maybe she died. The brook dried up. So what? 
Well, let's do a bit better. Than that. Let's pray and fast. Let's do some heart searching. Are you holding the power up? Is it you? Not me, of course. <clears throat> Someone else. Well, Lord, uh, it's getting critical. The demands for money are flooding us, and we've no money. And you supplied our needs until now. And he said, the Lord said, uh, uh, have I supplied your needs? I ask the people how many, come on, ask, ask the whole of your staff, how many of us are expecting this woman in America to send us money? Every hand went up. You're not trusting me, you're trusting that woman in America. So they had a nice little time of repentance and a few tears and apologies to God and said, Lord, we'll never look to America again. But they still prayed. A nice check came from Australia. <coughs> of course, God had touched the heart over there. What's the problem? So easy to get tied up to a method or a person. Yeah. Hmm? But the Lord thy God is a jealous God. Keep that in your mind. He is jealous. Yeah. He's jealous about the time we spend on other things and don't serve him time. Very often the book doesn't dry up with us. We, we let the thing get away from us. We know where our, where our supply is, but we feel, well, oh, we were in a good class this morning. We had a good time. Now, thank God for all you get in being taught here. But by the same token, you've got to keep a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't live on theology. You can't live on emotion. You can't live on zeal. They'll all evaporate. They're all dry, the brooks that dry up. And God will make you as dry some days. My goodness, you think, God, what's that going to happen? You never had time like that, do you, Melody? You do occasionally. Oh. <clears throat> Look, lodge this in your mind. There are seasons in the Christian life that God gives us. Yeah. You may go through a spell that would last a week or maybe a month when it looks as though God's closed down altogether. The heavens are like brass. Seems as though God isn't getting through to you. I love that old hymn that says, His wisdom never faileth, his sight is never dim. He knows the way he taketh, and I will walk with him. Of course, lodge this bit of wisdom in your mind too. God does not owe, owe you or me any explanations. If he wants to keep you in grade one, Winston Churchill was one of the greatest men that ever lived. I didn't meet him. I saw him one day. Greatest man in... Side 2. H-A-R-R-O-W. And it was a great grief to many people that the school that, where the princes of England go and princes from other countries is eaten that he wouldn't go to that school. He was born in the largest house in England. It's about twice the size of Buckingham Palace. Blenheim Palace. Top many rooms, he has six or seven hundred rooms. And he went to Eton. And when he got to a certain level, they wouldn't give him a grade up. To, you don't get diplomas in England. But they wouldn't move him up into that, what, what we would call what? You call them... Uh, grade, yes. Or uh, for, forms, they call them in England. Form. Form one up to five, five or six. They kept him in form two, I think it was, for a year. Wouldn't move him up, much to the disgust of his lordly father, who was a lord, very wealthy, wealthy man. Father disgusted. Why didn't you move my son up? Because he has not mastered English. That happened a second year. Oh, his father's scratching his head. Is my boy retarded? What's wrong with him? He went through three, year, three years in that one class, and he said it was the greatest blessing of his life. Surely he kicked and squirmed. He wanted to go up in the class. All the other, oh, there's old Winnie. Oh, what a dummy he is. He'd been in that class now for three years. But look at the states when he became. Look at the writings he made. You know, we won't all go up the escalator together, even at last days, as super as it may be here. We grow individually. Some of us are quick to comprehend and some of us are not quick to comprehend. Who knows, this may be your cave. 
<laughs> because you see it's pretty dark in a cave <coughs> he had no electric light in case you don't know where were we verse 7 ok so the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land and the word of the Lord came unto him saying arise and go to Zarephath which belongs to Zidon and dwell there behold I have commanded a widow woman to feed thee there see all these stages in his life he doesn't go from A to Z in one step There's no, it's no good saying you know I, I went to my Bible school for a year or six months or whatever it is <clears throat> well but this may be a stopping place I'm not sure they let you stay here three years in this class but it doesn't mean because you shake off the school that you've matured you may graduate and get a diploma in a school wherever you go but that doesn't mean we're mature in the sight of God he still has a lot of shaping up to do in our lives <coughs> the greatest thing that God can do is to make men and women there's a slogan I've seen it many times in many homes or in shops Bible shops prayer changes things I don't like that <clears throat> I say prayer changes people and people change things you cannot have a prayer life and be static right. you want to go in grace pray what did the disciples do they went off somewhere what did Jesus do he went into the mountain to pray you read the Gospel of Luke, you'll discover that in the Gospel of Luke he emphasizes the prayer life of Jesus more than Matthew and Mark. <clears throat> yes, sure, Jesus was baptized in John. The, the, a dove descended upon him, but Luke says while he was praying, a dove descended on him. Sure, he was crucified on a cross, but Luke says that while he was crucified, he was praying. What else did he do? <clears throat> he went on a mount of transfiguration that must have been awesome there's nothing like that until you get to Revelation there had been something before I'm sure Isaiah 6 is the same thing in the Old Testament language but <clears throat> Jesus was praying while he was transfigured there's nothing will transform your life more than prayer that is prayer based on the word of God yeah. the very pains of hell will get hold of you sometime if you not, not now maybe when you get a bit older in spiritual life there's a time when a girl is too young to bear children there's a time when a woman is too old there are times in our life I'm convinced of this when we are fruit should be fruitful in God and we miss it and we never get the chance again I said that once, I think it was 1950, the first time I came to America and I was in a Christian Missionary Alliance church <clears throat> in Louisville and when I said it in the morning service the pastor was halfway up the church and he walked down on his hands and knees crawled on his hands and knees to the altar and held onto that altar and he just cried, he bellowed Oh God, don't let my church become too old to bear children what it Shakespeare said there's a time in the affairs of men which taken by the, in the, by the flood leads on to higher things if a boat the big boat misses the misses the misses the what do you call it now the tide it can't get into the harbor there are tides in all our lives we better obey God when we know that that anointing is there you may feel dog tired getting into bed you feel an urge to pray and then the body wants to take over snap at the body and say you're not taking over I'm going to pray the last two or three weeks I'd gone to bed at 10 o'clock at night and got up at 12 and worked till 2 or 3 and felt as fit and fresh as I've ever felt in my life. I'm going to try and keep that habit up. You can't tell the Lord to lay off. When he starts working on you, obey him. Yeah. You know, this man Elijah is a remarkable character, I say. I think he should have been in the well <clears throat> let me put it this way if I'd been <laughs> if I'd been writing Hebrews 11 I would have put him in wouldn't you wouldn't you have put in a man that can 
change the weather, terrify a king. They have armies looking for him. Isn't that amazing? I'd like uh, Mr. Reagan, I hope he stays in four more years. If he doesn't, we're sunk. There's a fellow keeps saying on TV, uh, I, I, I hope you know that I was invited to the White House again. Why advertise it? Do you think Ahab would have invited Elijah to dinner? Yeah. Do you think Herod would have invited John Baptist to dinner? They were scared to death of these men. Fancy, they, they turned an army out. <coughs> Do you know they put an all nations alert out for a man of God? Isn't that something? Well, just look miserable. I think it is. <clears throat> what does it say in the 18th chapter and verse 10 as the Lord thy God liveth there is no nation or kingdom whither my Lord has not sent to seek thee bless God why what did he have an atom bomb in his pocket he doesn't have an army he isn't in rebellion against the nation he hasn't sworn to destroy the king why, why are they terrified of a man of God was it Elisha, the next, the next character, where, where the king said, I forget, I get these two mixed up sometimes, where, where the king says, you know that fellow, that preacher guy, he knows what I say in my bedroom. Isn't that something? And we thought ESP was everything. <clears throat> or bugging. He was bugging the king's bedroom. He knew what the king said. <laughs> Find that man. He knows all my plans. Isn't that amazing? You know, one thing that really hurts me is the church is always one step behind the devil. I think we ought to be one step ahead of him. Somebody should come and say, I had a revelation. You know, if this is going to be an ordinary school, I'm wasting my time. I say this with all my heart. I want last day's ministry to be one of the most, if not the most exceptional Bible school in the world. It won't be easy, but it's possible. The great curse of the church of Jesus Christ today is mediocrity. There are too many of us too much alike. This man's a phenomenal man. Who, who were on the Mount of Transfiguration, Transfiguration with Jesus? Who? Right, but who else came up from another world? Two men from another age, another world turned up. I wonder Peter didn't stand on his head and say, Hey, now tell me this. How did they know that they were who? Moses and who? How did they know? They'd never seen photographs of them. Fun? Who did? Yeah, but, but I mean the disciples, when they first came, didn't know for sure. But in any case, they were there. Now, lots of people, and I can understand this, I was reading Ezekiel recently, one of the, some of the great Jewish scholars say Ezekiel was the greatest man that the Jewish nation ever had, the greatest leader. Others say, no, no, that position was held by Isaiah. But it wasn't Isaiah and Ezekiel that were on the Mount of Transfiguration. It was Enoch and who? It was Moses and who? <coughs> In the last book of the Revelation, when the men are slain in the street, who are the two prophets? Why? Pun? Right. Because they never died and it's appointed unto man once to die, so they have to come back and go through the middle like the rest of us. <laughs> that may not be the uh, only answer, but it's the best because I told you. <laughs> now I'm trying to show you what a phenomenal character this man Elijah is the king's afraid of him armies are afraid of him <coughs> watch this old watch of mine again <coughs> chapter 18 let's skip over to that No, no, sorry, well, let's go back a minute. 
chapter 9, verse 9 of chapter 17, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongs to Zidon, and dwell there. Stop there. Here's a stopping place. I have commanded a widow woman. What had he done before? He commanded a raver. Now he commands a widow woman. God changes his method. Why didn't Elijah say, Lord, I, I can't do that now. I mean, uh, I mean, I'm a man of God. I mean, it wouldn't look right for me to go sponging on a widow. Well, that's the only people TV ra uh, preachers get on, isn't it? <coughs> sponging on widows. I have commanded a widow to feed thee, to sustain thee. And he rose and went and did as the Lord commanded him. Now he goes and tells this woman, what have you got? She said, I have a handful of meal and a little oil. And uh, what are you going to do with it? Make a cake for my son and I. We're going to eat it and what? Die like everybody else. She went and did according to the saying of Elijah. She and her house did eat many days. The battle of wheel were wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word which God had given to Elijah. Well, you see, when she went back in the house, was she startled? You know, that, that little cruise of oil was shooting up like an Oklahoma gusher and going out of the front door and down the front street and the neighbors were gathering oil and the 50... 50 gallon barrel of meal was full to the brim? No. You know, God could send all the money that last days needs from here till Jesus comes with, with one donation. He doesn't do that. You don't want him to, Martin. Okay. <laughs> Why didn't he supply everything that they needed to the end of the trip? Because she had to exercise faith every day, that's why, and take the last handful of meal out of the barrel and the last drop of oil and put them together. That's the way God works. We get so self-confident. Boy, we can get arrogant without having miracles like that. We can get self-satisfied and self-sufficient. It didn't fail until God ripped the heavens again. <clears throat> It came to pass after these things, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick, and sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, thou man of God? I like this 19th verse. He said unto her, Give me thy son. Don't you know who I am? Have I been so long here? You haven't realized I'm the greatest miracle worker? Now, of course, I can't do this in private. I, you, you need to get at least 10,000 people. I mean, it's no good being humble if people don't know it, is it? <clears throat> it's no good having power if you can't exhibit it. He took the child out of her bosom and carried it into a loft. Oh, mercy. You wish sometimes when he'd had a real anointing in prayer, you'd really been in a prayer meeting where everybody could hear you pray, and boy, would have they have been stirred if I'd prayed that publicly. Now, this is where we learn to pray. When thou was shut the door, he ran up into a loft. What did he do? Yeah. Verse 21 says, He stretched himself on the child three times <clears throat> and cried unto the Lord and said, O oh, my Lord God, here I pray thee, and let this child's soul come into him again. What happened? Nothing. <clears throat> prayed once, nothing happened. Prayed twice, nothing happened. Prayed three times. You know what most of us would do is say, look, I'm wasting time, nothing's happening. But again, faith that is going to be trusted is going to be tested. He doesn't say he prayed three say he prayed three times to shut up heaven. He said, I shut up heaven that there'd be no rain. Doesn't say he prayed three times for the rain to come down. <clears throat> but God tests him. I've heard people scorn, you know, churches like the Church of England and others. Oh, they've so much ritual. But we've got out of ri ritualism into ritualism. 
Yeah. Do you know what a rut is? It's a grave with the ends knocked out. <coughs> That's all it is. It's a grave with the ends knocked out. And if you walk in the spirit, I'll tell you this, you'll never get into a rut. Right. God may completely revolutionize your way of prayer. Or your times of prayer. He prayed, nothing happened. He prayed again, nothing <clears throat> but the third time he stretched himself on the child that is intimacy his compassion his longing and he prayed and the child came alive if I were a painter I think I'd like to paint this you know they have an outside staircase on those old eastern houses I'd like to see him coming down with a baby clutching his beard and the baby gurgling and, he, and there's a, the woman and he says hey sister here's your baby catch it Do you think he did that? No, we would with our showmanship. He took the child and gave it to the woman. Elijah took the child, verse 23, and took the child and he brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See! Do you think he whispered it? Could I just whisper this in your ear? Your son's alive. I guess he was as much alive as she was. Hey, your son's living! What did he say? You know, I've just been sitting in my rocking chair thinking about you, and I was thinking, this man Elijah's a wonderful man. Uh, he must be a godly man because uh, the barrel of meal is still going, and the water's, the oil is there, and the meal is there. No. It seems as though she wasn't too impressed with that. What was she impressed with? By this, he said. She says, I know thou art a man of God. What? By what? By the fact that he brought life where there was death. Isn't that the ministry of the church? You hath he quickened who were dead. You know, I think sometimes we shoot right over the heads of people. We try and infer that every man there, that smart guy is running about with his office girl, and the guy around there, that deacon's embezzling money. And we imply that all, they've got secret corruption, which many people do not have. Some do assure. I don't believe the first argument that God has with a man is that he's dead, bad. I believe his first argument is that he's dead. Yeah. What happened when the prodigal came home? He, his brother goes to his dad and says, uh, Oh, what kind of a dad are you? Look, I never caused you any heartbreak. I never stayed out all night and left you wondering where I was. I've been a good boy. You never killed a fatty calf for me. Why didn't you kill a, kill a fatty calf for me? He said, because I don't have any. What are all those out there? They're yours. Your brother took his half of the estate in cash. All the estate here, all the, est all the land is yours. All the cattle are yours. What are you doing with them? You know, I believe God is saying that to the church today. We've got a prodigal church. Satisfied. Enlarging its borders looking at its crops, exhibiting them maybe at the state fair. Men and women are not just bad, they're worse than that, they're dead in flesh with and in sin. Now, when the, the a prodigal says to his father, let me tell you something, I've been keeping tabs on my brother. He's been living an immoral life, gambling, drinking, wild, he's dragged the family name into the gutter. Have you noticed that the father never once accused the boy of sin? He didn't say, my, the boy, the, the elder son said, my brother's bad. The father said, he's dead. You know, there are only two kinds of people in the world. Not rich and poor, not black and white, not intellectuals and dumb folk. Not slaves and free. Just two kinds of people in the world. The Lord really put this on my mind last year. Just two kinds, that's all. People who are dead in sin and people who are dead to sin. Now, you're in one of either category. You can't be in both. Dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. Now, that needs thinking out. Surely it does. Read Philippians 2. Isn't it Philippians 2 that begins, In time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to in time past. Trouble with most churches today, they're still in Romans 7. 
Oh, wretched man that I am. Don't tell us. You're advertising it with your face. Oh, wretched man that I am. But he didn't stay there. That happens to be chapter 8. Yeah. Chapter 7 is a funeral march. Chapter 8 is a wedding march. Yeah. Any of you ever read Milton, Milton's Paradise Lost? Did you? No, none of you? One of the great classics. You read it good. <clears throat> it's an interesting thing. He wrote Paradise Lost after he got married. <clears throat> <laughs> now that's true. It's facetious. No, no, it's true. But then he wrote Paradise Regained. When? After his wife died. <laughs> now that's historic fact. And you know, I think about every time I read Romans 7. This is Paradise Lost. Romans 8, Paradise Regained. You know, most Christians could be as victorious if they were Mohammedans. They have no more victory over sin than the Mohammedans have. Either sin has dominion over you or you have dominion over sin. You're either dead in sin or you're dead to sin. Right. You know, there comes a time, if we go on to know the Lord, where we not only go to the cross, but where we get on the cross. Now, a man can kill himself, drink poison, cut his throat, shoot himself, but he can't crucify himself. Supposing he could cross his feet and put, get a hammer and nail, drive them through, he could nail this hand to, the, to a, a cross maybe, but then he's free with the other hand. Crucifixion is something that God does. Again, in Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin that might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. <clears throat> Now, I'm quite sure in Old Testament language, you see, there's so much of Elijah that's kind of reborn. Now, I'm not talking about reincarnation, that's nonsense. You can shatter that forever by the fact, again, it is appointed unto man once to die, not to die every 25 or 30 or 100 years. Just once. <clears throat> but Elijah and John Baptist have the same thing. They both have the same anointing. They both worked in deserts. They both, both wore, wore camel's clothes, uh, camel skins. They both had trouble with the king. They both had trouble with the queen. Neither of them got much attention. But that's the cost of, of, of being an outstanding man or woman for God. What does Elijah do? <clears throat> Chapter 18. It came to pass after many days the word of the Lord came to Elijah in a third year saying, Go, show thyself. It was go hide thyself in the previous chapter. Go show thyself to Ahab and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself to Ahab and there was a sore famine in Samaria. And Ahab called o Obadiah, who was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. It was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took took a hundred and hid them in, a, in fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. That's all they deserved anyhow. <clears throat> Let's go to verse 17. It came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah. Ahab said, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? <laughs> Isn't that something? <clears throat> oh, I'd just love to hear that Mr. Reagan said, Well, I'm starting my second four years. My first uh, thing that I've told the government to do is close down last day's ministry. That would be an honor. They're such a trouble to me. They're setting up barriers against my jurisdiction. <clears throat> Better still it would be, again, as I've said before, you know, the greatest honor in the world was given to Paul, the apostle, my great hero after Jesus. Remember somebody tried to cast demons out of a man and the demons got up and kicked the preachers around. I think they did right. What did they say? Jesus I know and Paul I know. Isn't that something to be bracketed with Jesus by demons? Listen, preacher boy or missionary fellow that expects to go to missionary, you're not much good until you're on the devil's danger list. And that means you'll go through hell maybe on earth while you're there. 
demons stand back and say, Jesus, every time Jesus moved, there was a commotion in hell. What in the world is he going to do? Everywhere Paul went, he had one of two things, a riot or a revival. We have neither. I think I'm right in saying this. Check with Martin if I'm wrong. He'll tell you after. <clears throat> Wasn't it? In the days of Solomon, there were no prophets, were there? Why? Well, in God's name, why do you need prophets when the glory of God fills the temple? The trouble is we've neither glory nor prophets. Yes. And we still go on, satisfied. We don't say we're going to be like Elijah. We're going to, we're going to stand together as a group here. And you can do it, of course, as a family here at last days. So we're going to believe God for rain to come, yes. blessing to come, power to come. In a way that we've never known before. Why should this year be like last? Right. It may have been good. Why not better? Yeah. <clears throat> oh, thou he that troubleth Israel. What a joke. Next verse. He answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou. Hey, hold it, hold it, boy. You get your head chopped off. You're talking to the king. He'll feed you to the birds. Right? The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Hey, wait a minute. That's only part of the story. It's not the biggest part. I'm not troubled, Israel, but thou and thy father's house. Oh, boy, don't bring the relatives in with it. <laughs> they have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and they followed Berlin. Listen, here is a man that hasn't a house, he hasn't a servant, he's no money. As people say when they double the negatives, he's no nothing. Here's this little upstart, the king has armies searching for him, and he stands face toe to toe with the king and says, Listen, boy, you better put your house in order. Why? <clears throat> You t just follow my directions. What are, what are the directions? Send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel. Hey, hey, uh, wait a minute. You're a bit rash, aren't you? Why? Well, these folk are hungry. They're ragged. They're not only hungry, they're angry. He says, send and gather to me all Israel to Mount Carmel. And then to make bad worse, not only wants the nation, he wants all the backslidden preachers there. Bring all the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which sat at Jezebel's table. <clears throat> what a man. Either he's an idiot or he knows God's mind and he has God's power and he has God's authority. Yeah. Telling the king, you, you, you just get everybody rounded up. The nearly a million people, I don't know how they got them rounded up. Plus all the prophets are there. I guess that scared them to death. I was looking at that verse yesterday in Proverbs 11:14. In the multitude of counselors there is safety. There's a time when we need to take counsel one of the other. But where is it? What, what, what is it now? In Galatians 1.16, Paul says, Neither confer I with flesh and blood. There's a time when you can't confer with flesh and blood. If you go out on a limb, you go out on a limb. By yourself? No, with God. Yeah. I was reading that verse there again in, the other day. It's, it's really bowled me over. I got to preach on it before long. Never done that in all my years of preaching where where John saw Jesus, and he, I fell at his feet as dead. What do you want to say about it? I say, you're better dead at the feet of Jesus than alive anywhere else anyhow. Yeah. What if we get a night like that here, Melody dear? And the glory of God comes, and we all fall down. I don't mean this business of being slain, you know, where all you get is a bump at the back of your head. I mean a revelation of God's holiness, blinding glory and majesty until nobody speaks around on the ground maybe for another week we're so subdued with his holiness and his majesty and his glory God's going to have to do something to smash up this mediocrity 
It's all like, it's all like saying, Lord, I want you to do it, but it's costly. Yeah. Costly. Yeah. Mm. Now, where do we go? We better hurry. Okay. <clears throat> Um, let's go to verse what, 30 Elijah said to all the people come near unto me and all the people came near unto him and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down come on now we're all pretty smart at making new vows what about all those we've broken hmm? don't stand building new altars till you go back and repair the old one the promise you made and you didn't keep you got caught on a wave of uh, emotion in some meeting and promised money you didn't have. And I would never ask people in an atmosphere like that for money. I never ask people for money anyhow. What about the vow you said? I'm going, right from now until I die, I'm going to at least have a, a, an hour with God every day and you haven't done it. Well, don't start stretching out over here till you go back and build that old altar up. It's recorded up there. You may have forgotten it. Forgotten what you said. Forgotten the high wave of emotion you were on. But he doesn't say, listen, I'm Elijah. I want to show you some new things, you know. I'm the fellow that raised that baby from the dead. I suppose you know that. And there's the widow that I supplied food for by the grace of God. Now he comes around and all these guys are staring at him. <clears throat> he says, you can have the first turn. They took a bullock, verse 26, which he gave them, which was given. They dressed it. I wonder what in. <clears throat> And called on Baal from morning till noon, saying, Baal, hear us. It came to pass that Elijah got sarcastic. I remember one day talking with Dr. Tozer. He said, Len, I got a letter the other day from somebody who said, You're awfully sarcastic. And he said, Yes, so I am. Well, is it scriptural? He said, Elijah was. He said, When the whole nation's in a tither, in a de you know, all, all, all shaky. He says, Well, call. Maybe you've gone shopping or gone to see his mother-in-law. Maybe he's on vacation. He won't be back for two days. He mocked them. Why not? He knew the word of the Lord to him. Yeah. They cried aloud and they cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets. My goodness, they were serious, weren't they? Verse 30, Elijah said, Come to, near to me. He repaired the altar of the Lord which was broken down. He took twelve stores according to the number of the tribe of the sons of Jacob. He put them all together to show them now that the twelve tribes are reunited, that they're solid. <clears throat> now what did he do? Looked up his Old Testament. He can't do anything with a, without a word from the Lord. Oh, this is a wonderful verse, I think. Verse 30 says, It came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came to him and said, Lord God of Abraham, now, let's go back. That's what he was doing, sitting in the dark in that cave. Every time the devil assaulted him, he says, look what God did for Abraham. Gave him a son. What, how old was he? Over 90. His wife, 90. The impossible. Well, darling... Uh, Abraham, you're a wonderful man. She called him Lord, you know. That was something. Uh, do you think you really heard from the word? You, you know what the custom is around here? That if you have no children, you can take the choice of the servants and have a child by that girl. Have you ever found that when you tried to help God out, you got in a mess? Yeah. Boy, if he hadn't have done that, we'd have, been, we'd have had no Arabs. It's not the trouble we get, it's trouble we get bring to other people that matters. Then later, what did the Lord say? Take thy son, thine only son. Well, all the blessing in the Old Testament went to the eldest son, who happened to be the child of the flesh. God won't touch flesh. He cried to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. God wasn't concerned with Ishmael. As a matter of fact, he wasn't concerned with Abraham either. Well, didn't he want Abraham? Didn't he want, pardon me, didn't, didn't he want his only son Isaac? No. 
What did he want? He wanted Abraham. What good is a dead child to God or anybody else? God doesn't have to prove me to himself. He knows me better. He has to prove me to myself. He has to show me how deep my faith is, how deep my love is, how deep my courage is. How deep my strength is. I need a revelation of myself. As seen by God's eye, not seen by my friends, they'll be generous to me. I'll sure be generous to myself if I start searching my heart. <clears throat> Take thy son, thine only son. And he goes three days up a mountain. What do you think he felt about all the way he was going up? What happened? I remember preaching this in Australia and, a, and an old man came up to me afterwards. He said, you made a mistake while you were preaching. I said, I make a lot of mistakes when I'm preaching. But he said, you know, you, you said about Abraham putting his hand on the boy and lifting the knife up and uh, he got the knife nearly down and suddenly a voice in the, behind him said, stay thy hand. <clears throat> and I said, you know what most of us would say? That's the voice of the devil. It was just by the bend of the stream down there where the Lord told me to climb up that mountain and offer my child and I'm going to obey God. He stayed his hand, why? <clears throat> because God couldn't win. Doesn't the scripture say he believed that if he killed a child, God would raise him up as good as dead? He's as good as dead, so what? God is the God of resurrection. God is the God of life. You go to a mission field and you've been there about two days, you'll think you've broken into hell. The climate's different, the food's different, the culture's different, the atmosphere's different. There's nothing like America or anywhere else when you get into a hell hole like that. I remember going up into New Guinea, up into the highlands of New Guinea, where those men wear feathers three, four feet high. Big slams of concrete on the chest. Tomahawks in the hands. They look very nice in National Geographic. <laughs> but boy, when I was, I was near some grass as tall as this, and it rustled, and I looked, and here's a guy. Now, this is funny, but it's true. What could I give him? I knew you about it. Do you know what I had? There were two men and myself. No, three men there were. And you know, I just happened to have three lifesavers in my pocket. <laughs> and I gave them one each and it saved my life. <laughs> <clears throat> no, that's really true. I just had, I, I got a packet when I was in Australia. And I just felt, I saw these guys, oh, what can I do? And I gave one, you know, what they did one. And he says, roo, 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 roo. felt real good. So they all wanted, just had three and I got away with it. <clears throat> but I tell you what, when you face a situation like that, you've got to know your way, where God wants you to be. And when that's an everyday occurrence, as it is for missionaries up there, you better be rooted. You better have something you can throw at the devil. Particularly if you're going to graduate in the school of God where even devils had to say, we've given that man a... Our congratulations. He's just like Jesus Christ. He's a terror. It must be Jesus living inside of him. Well, that's what it's supposed to be, isn't it? Christ in you. The hope of glory. <clears throat> okay. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Remember his other name, Jacob, vacillating, changeable. And God changes it to Israel, a prince with God. And then lest he get flattered, he read the 41st chapter of Isaiah, he calls Jacob a worm. Not very flattering. When my sister couldn't get the best of me, she'd say, you worm. <laughs> oh, I could have thrown the piano at her. The only thing is, <laughs> I couldn't lift it. But that got through to me more than anything she ever said. You, and I used to think of the worms in the garden that I had to gather up sometimes. Wesley has a hymn in which he says he calls a worm his friend. He, Jacob, the, the friend of God, like Abraham. But he's a worm in the sight of God unless he gets exalted as a prince. And he's turning all this over there in his private chapel there in that cave. Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Now notice his prayer. Let it be known this day. He doesn't say, Lord, uh, there are 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal, and I want you to uh, 
give me a chance to bring some of them up? No, the hundred special men, those men that really pray, that have been hidden by, or was it who hid them? Obadiah took the prophets and hid them in a cave by fifties. Well, Lord, don't, I don't, I'm not bothered about the seven thousand. I'm bothered about that hundred. Two pockets of fifty men. I need them here to pray with me. I mean, Moses had Aaron and her. I heard recently, and this is true, of a, a young preacher up in the hills of Kentucky. And he was going around the hills, you know, and there were these little mission churches all over. And he said, what about, who's the pastor there? And they said, Miss so-and-so. Miss so-and-so? A pastor? Yeah. And he went up and he said, uh, are you the pastor? She said, I show sure is. You the pastor? I show sure is. You can't have a lady pastor. Well, Moses had them. Moses had them yet. He had Aaron and her. <laughs> and he said, if he had her there, I's the her here. <laughs> <clears throat> so what? I tease the Baptists about that. One of them Baptist women preach. They send them all to the foreign field. The Baptist pastors stay, stay home and drive Lincolns. That's true of other denominations too, isn't it? Ship all the women. C.G. Stubb used to say, women are the men for the job. Let it be known this day that thou art a God in Israel, and I am thy servant. Why didn't he say that first? Lord, Lord, look, all these people gathered here, hundreds of them, thousands of them, all these priests, corrupt religion. Now, Lord, vindicate me as your, as your child, as your mouthpiece. So much of my ministry has been secret. Helping that widow, praying up in a loft. Everybody needs a loft anyhow. Okay.